This is the Right Reverend Gregory Brewer's address to the 45th Annual Convention of the Episcopal Diocese of Central Florida at St. George's Church, The Villages, Florida, January 25th, 2014. So the Lord be with you. Let us pray. Lord Jesus Christ, you stretched out your arms of love on the hard wood of the cross that everyone might come within the reach of your saving embrace. So clothe us in your spirit, that we, reaching forth our hands in love, may bring those who do not know you to the knowledge and love of you, for the honor of your name. Amen. Amen. It is my joy to stand before you at the second convention that I, at which I am the bishop of the Diocese of Central Florida. I want you to know that I bring you personal greetings and prayers from my two immediate predecessors, John Howe and Bishop Bill Falwell, as well as Bishop Lloyd Allen of Honduras. They each wrote to tell me that they are praying for us as we gather together, and I'm exceedingly grateful for their prayers. Also, as some of you may know, Chris Falwell took a fall a few weeks ago. She is progressing slowly, but is in fact progressing, and Bill is being Bill, complaining about all the aches and pains of old age. Um, they're both actually in many ways doing really quite well, and they send their love from North Carolina, as do John and Karen from Orlando. Um, they all send their love and prayers. I also received a note from the presiding bishop's office telling me of the prayers offered last Wednesday on behalf of our convention at the Chapel of Our Lord at the Episcopal Church headquarters. We also have with us Ken, Canon Angela Eiffel. Angela, where are you? Are you here? Is she here? Oh, there you are. Hi, Angela. Um, who is here. Um, and please, Angela, convey our appreciation and gratitude, in fact, for those prayers. I know that there are other individuals and congregations who are and have been praying for us, including the Daughters of the King, for whom intercession is a vocational calling. New chapters of the Daughters of the King have been springing up around the diocese, and I want you to know it is very, very gratifying. As some of you know, I never take lightly the gift of intercessory prayer. It is, in fact, the irreplaceable ingredient that strengthens and buoys us by the Spirit of God. There is no adequate substitute for concerted and regular intercessory prayer. In fact, I have this sense that when we get to heaven and the annals of eternity are in fact open, we are going to find, particularly those of us who are up front a lot, that if progress was made in the kingdom, it was really not so much by our uh, strategies or our great ideas, but it was actually done in the secret rooms of those who really fought on our behalf in intercessory prayer. I just know that I stand or fall by the intercessory prayers of other people, and I am always grateful. When I think about what it's been like to serve here in the diocese this past year, I found a metaphor. Some of you have seen it. It is a video. Uh, it was taken in Honduras with me on a zip line several thousand feet up in the air. Are you so oh, well, you can show us. <laughs> this is up in the mountains near Copan. What's funny is, is that there's a look, there's a Honduran in front of me with my camera. And since it's on an incline and I weigh more than he does, I keep going into it. Most of you know, in May of this past year, Laurelie and I spent three weeks in our companion diocese of Honduras at language school in Copan where we learned some very rudimentary skills in Spanish. So I now, if I work hard and have a script, sound like a toddler. Um, <laughs> but Laurelie knows more Spanish than I do since she took it in high school. Um, I also presided at two communion services at the Spiritu Sancto, the closest Episcopal Church to Copan, as well as bringing official greetings to that congregation and to the diocese, all of which was in Spanish. 
and even spent some time as a part of a healing prayer team that was going on at a vigil that was held at that church. That was just a blast. Um, Laura Lee and I also had the privilege of sharing a lunch with the Archbishop of Canterbury uh, in his palace in, in, uh, in Canterbury uh, with his wife Caroline, along with our son Todd, who is studying in Durham, getting his PhD in New Testament, and his wife and five other American bishops who are members of the communion partners. That's just a shot I took of him in his study. We shared a communion service together in their family chapel, and then the bishops met privately with Archbishop Welby for actually the better part of an afternoon. It was an extraordinary generous gift of his time, discussing the state of the communion, and he too assures us of his prayers. Other travels include meetings of the House of Bishops, a meeting of Province Four Bishops, and a visit to four of our seminaries, the Swanee School of Theology, I go there as a board member as well as an owning bishop, the Shutter House, where I preached at their weekly Eucharist and met with seminarians, Trinity School for Ministry, where I also met for, with seminarians. I'm also a board member there. And finally, thanks be to God, finishing a long-standing doctorate of ministry degree. Um, I also finished, visited Virginia Theological Seminary, of which I am an alum, to see what they were doing to train as future leaders. And also, over the course of the year, at Swanee and VTS received two honorary doctorates. Um, as you know, the raising up of future leaders, both lay and ordained, is a crucial piece of what we are doing here in this diocese. And the need is for now as well as the future. As you are aware, it is for that purpose that Canon Holcomb has joined our staff. Since our last convention, I ordained six people to the transitional diaconate, David Bumstead, Megan Farr, Reggie Kidd, Jose Rodriguez, Barry Smith, and Jerry De Jesus, and four to the priesthood, James Brzezinski, Rebecca Tolster, David Bumstead, and Jose Rodriguez. Around the diocese, I've made 38 Sunday morning congregational visits, a few less than last year, but only because I was in Honduras as well as an additional 93 congregational and diocesan events. Everything from Crucio closings to a visit to the newly revived New Beginnings Retreat for middle school students. Thank you very much, Phyllis Bartle, for your leadership. Uh, I spoke at, for two evenings at a conference on the healing ministry at All Saints Winter Park. Laura Lee and I have hosted eight clergy spouse dinners that total over 200 guests. And Laura Lee has revived the annual spouse lunch event for clergy spouses. And we had it at our house. 70 spouses came to our home for an outdoor meal. And of course, there was the spouse lunch today. And as you, needless to say, Laura Lee continues to be famous for her hats. <laughs> we also host annually the Diocesan Staff Christmas Party. It was a great time of delicious food. Everybody brings it. There's a cutthroat gift exchange. Uh, the thing most wanted this year was a bottle of scotch. Um, and this year, we had a very special occasion where we gave thanks for the 45th anniversary of Canon Ernie Bennett's ordination. He actually also got his own special bottle of single malt. <laughs> this has been a year of firsts. This is the first time, according to at least our historic annals, that any presiding bishop of the Episcopal Church has come for an official visit. Uh, yes, some presiding bishops have come to preach at local churches, but Catherine Jefford Shorey has visited every diocese in the Episcopal Church, and we were, in fact, the very last diocese to host her visit. Another first was the celebration of the 30th anniversary of the Canterbury Retreat and Conference Center, now continuing under the leadership of John Davis. Uh, I was the first Episcopal, maybe even clergy person, but certainly bishop, to preach at First Baptist Orlando, the host site for my ordination and consecration. And this is the first time the diocese has employed a halftime canon for, vo for vocations. You were present at the Eucharist yesterday afternoon when we commissioned both Canon Holcomb and our chaplain for retired clergy, Jim Kurtz. A third person has also been retained specifically on a part-time basis to serve our youth. That is Mr. Steve Schneeberger. Steve, where are you? Would you stand? I know he's here. There he is, Steve. We are so glad that you are here. He's gonna share a little bit about himself later. I want to say this. 
Uh, he is the executive director of Youth Ministry Institute of Orlando. He has a passion for helping youth ministers to become genuine leaders. He will be acting as a consultant to any congregation in the diocese that needs his assistance. The diocese has agreed to cover Steve's fees and travel expenses so that any congregation can use Steve as a consultant with the bill going to the diocese. In other words, you won't get charged. Um, that could be a consultation on how to start a youth ministry because you don't have anything going or working with an existing youth group no matter what its size to make it better. It does not matter the size of the church from a very few youth with a volunteer to a large congregation with a full-time youth staff. Uh, I would encourage you to contact him and you will hear more from him later. Each of these actions are tied directly to the strategic plan that came out this year, past year 2013. It began with parish surveys, uh, a leadership team was formed that included present and former members of the diocese and board and standing committees. We met in early February and later the plan was approved by the diocese and board. I'm happy to say that we are in fact starting to fulfill that plan. This is not one of those plans where everybody takes a survey and then you never see it again. Um, I want to go over those five key points very briefly and talk about what we've done and how it relates to us trying to fulfill that plan. Number one was a commitment to strengthen our relationships with one another in the diocese. Uh, that's one of the reasons that Laurelie and I started these dinners, is because what we wanted to do was recreate again something that I knew when I was in this diocese 20 years ago, which was the sense of us being a family together. And I am profoundly committed that since all of us in the room here are believers in Jesus, even though we may be a very different theological stripes, that we respect and honor and serve one another as sisters and brothers in Christ and not live in the kind of party spirit that in fact can divide and really hurt us, not just relationally, but sap our energy for a mission that we may bring those who do not know you to the knowledge and love of you. Because if we're not doing that, we're not doing it. We're just not doing it. I'm continuing to show up at deanery meetings and other places to make myself available to pastorally support clergy as best I can. Uh, my passion is serving leaders. And they are on the front lines of ministry, and I want to do all that I can to continue to support them. Number two, a commitment to raise up new leaders, both clergy and lay. To that end, I have appointed Canon Holcomb. This year, we will be strengthening our offerings and continuing clergy education. I am working with Sarah Bronos, Rector of Good Shepherd Maitland, in the clergy events team for that. Um, I'm also working with a team of people to develop a conference for training lay leaders, probably sometime in 2015. Um, this is, I'm also working with Canon Holcomb in refining our process for a nation and with the people on the Commission on Ministry. Uh, Ken and Bennett and I have inaugurated an annual meeting where we meet with wardens, another first time event. Uh, because for me, to, for a congregation to succeed, and that's the point, it really takes a collaborative team. A team of clergy and lay people who honor one another, who respect one another, who really throw out the window the sort of old paradigm of the clergy takes care of the spiritual things and the lay leaders make sure that the bills get paid. Now, that's not unimportant, either of those things, but it is a, it is a splitting of how we understand ministry that I really don't believe is biblical. It, we should have a kind of collaborative respecting of one another's gifts and out of that, we find a way, prayerfully and in mutual submission, to move together in a way that, in fact, advances the kingdom. Lay people should never be considered as second-class citizens, ever, in the church or anywhere else. <laughs> Donations are continuing to come in for the Timothy Fund. More about that later. Not in, not in my presentation. So that by this coming fall, we will be able to fund, at a new level, residential seminary education. Also, I have appointed Mr. Craig Maughan, Headmaster of Trinity Preparatory School, to chair a committee whose charge is to make recommendations to the diocese on how best the diocese and our Episcopal schools can work together. 
You see, I'm trying to answer the question. What does it mean for a school to call itself an Episcopal school? How do you identify that? How does that show up in what happens in terms of their life together? Why do I think this is important? Because I think they are a gift. It's, again, all about leadership development. I believe that some of our best incubators for leadership are, in fact, these schools to which God has entrusted us. Number three, a commitment to look at our neighbors and our neighborhoods and face the missionary challenge that is in front of us. I believe that's, in fact, our biggest challenge, finding ways to reach out to our neighbors in such a way as people want to come and see who we are and hear the good news that God has given us. We need leaders who not only know how to read their Bibles, listen to this, we need leaders who know how to read their neighborhoods. Too often clergy and laity tragically limit their responsibility to the pastoral care of the people on their roles, rather than understanding that God has given them a responsibility to reach their region, their parish, their neighborhood, and in fact the world with the gospel. Do you know what the needs of your neighborhood are? How can those needs be met in the name of Jesus Christ? Some of our parishes have wonderful overseas partnerships, and I rejoice that they exist and would only want to see them flourish and even proliferate. But such an overseas partnership does not excuse an absence of evangelism and outreach into our local neighborhoods. I just have to ask, and you'll hear me asking this, tell me, how are you reaching your neighborhood? Number four, a commitment to take our place within the councils of the Episcopal Church. As far as is possible, I am committed to being an active member in the House of Bishops. That is why I am making the time to attend their meetings, to build relationships with them, and find ways to work together. That is why we are sending a full deputation to General Convention. That is why we welcome the presiding bishop to this diocese. That's why I go to the provincial meetings. We are not an outpost. We are a part of a larger family to which we want to prayerfully support find ways to be accountable, speak with clarity the theological convictions that we have given us, and in essence, be on the team. Number five, a commitment to revitalize children and youth ministry. The appointment of a diocesan youth consultant, Mr. Steve Schneeberger, is a step in that direction. I'm having conversations with people at both Wingman as well as Canterbury in that regard. I have a very strong support for what's happening with New Beginnings. My hope is, is that this year will be, especially for me, a time of exploration. Um, I spoke with our diocesan youth consultant this past week, and I said that my hope is, is that it not only will he serve congregations, but also provide feedback to me that I need so that we can find a better way to assess the state of youth and kids ministry in our diocese, to see what steps we should take to make this commitment of revitalization a reality. I don't want to just throw money at it. I, don't want to, I want us to have concerted and strategic action. How do we reach out in new ways to the children and youth God has given us in this diocese? Why is all of this important? Because the missionary challenge to reach our neighborhoods, our world, with the gospel is before us. That's what you heard yesterday from Kevin Higgins. When most people outside our fellowship think about our churches, they look like this. <laughs> To most people outside the Episcopal Church, we are considered largely irrelevant to the pressing and acknowledged spiritual hungers. It's not that they're not there. They just don't think of us when they think about how can I get those questions answered. As some of you have heard me say repeatedly, my commitment is to see congregations succeed. So what does succeeding congregations look like? Brief point. Uh, I, you need to know that I actually cripped these from Bill Hybels, who gave a talk at Holy Trinity Brompton in London about this very subject. Number one, succeeding, at succeeding congregations, people who are far from God come alive and are found in Christ. The question must always be in front of us as we are evaluating the effectiveness of our ministries is this, are lives being changed by the power of the gospel or not? If not, why not? And what do we need to do so that we can be more effective in actually seeing people come to Christ? Number two, 
alive and found people grow in Christ. They grow into maturity. Transformation happens when you come in contact with the Holy Trinity. You can't help but being touched by it. And that transformation is both personal and corporate. Congregations should start to look like Jesus in action. Luke 7, 22. Go and tell John that the blind see, the deaf hear, and the poor have good news preached to them. Number three, lonely people get drafted into biblical community, and they stop pretending. There can be an, art, an air of artificiality about our relationships in church, and especially about our worship. Church should not be a place where people pretend. It should be a place where people are loved enough to be real. And in so sharing what's really in their hearts, discovering the one who wants to fill their innermost being with his river of living water. Now, Number four, people find a purpose that guides them through the rest of their lives. One's purpose in life is not merely to have enough money to retire comfortably, play games, and hang out with one's grandchildren. That's not bad. And while many are happy with that, even in this community, that purpose is just too small. Our world is desperate for people who can give their lives in the service of something far, far greater. I want to ask, will you begin to prayerfully consider what purpose God has called you to fulfill? It's bigger than you think. In fact, I want you to know, just speaking anecdotally, the more I press in, the more I continue to be surprised, both by how amazing Jesus is, far beyond anything I could ever ask or imagine, but the fact that I get to get in on God's purposes in the earth and see lives change, to see communities begin to be transformed. Because what we're talking about here is not only individual evangelization. It has to do with challenging unjust structures. It has to do with being salt and light in the midst of your community. It's far bigger than anything that you and I ever think. And, but the only way we can get in it is, as Kevin said to us so clearly, is to step out and say, here I am, Lord, and see the doors that God opens in your life. Number five, people of beans, both small and great, begin to seize the opportunity to financially and personally give of their time and their money to see their neighborhoods and their world change for the better through the power of the gospel. I want to say that if the goal of your stewardship program is to pay the light bill, you will not get much response. People give to vision. It's not that paying the light pills are unimportant, believe me, I get that. But church and churches should be known, in fact, as places who pay their bills on time. It is an incredibly poor witness to have creditors knocking on your door. But in the end, people give their time, talent, and their treasure to a vision that calls them to something greater. And that greater is making a difference in our world and touching our world with the love and mercy of Jesus Christ. Am I being clear? The goal is not merely renewed congregations. I put this out on Twitter this morning. The goal is a renewed world, renewed communities. So that, for example, at St. John the Baptist in Washington Shores, the goal is not to see St. John the Baptist come alive in Christ. It is that. But in the end, so that Washington Shores can literally be touched by the power of the gospel. It, it's not just that St. George's in the village can have a whole network of ministries that care about each other. It's so that as people literally move here from all over the country, they begin to know that there's an alternative to just lowering your golf score. It's bigger than that. <laughs> It's renewing and saying, God, I want to be available for you and for your purposes. How can I be a part of that? And we're talking money. We are talking time. It's servanthood. It's understanding, especially that if you're someone who is moving into retirement and you have some accumulated income. If you want to live in fear, this isn't on my script. I'm going to say it anyway. <laughs> if you want to live in the fear 
of keeping a very large nest egg just in case something might happen to you physically. And that's a big concern. I get that. I'm now old enough to begin to think about such things. But if that's all you're doing with your income, you're robbing God, it says in Malachi. We are called to give financially and personally, sacrificially. Again, <laughs> not to pay the light bill, but to literally make a difference in our world. And if that's not being held up in your church, then clergy and lay leaders, get with it. Or it may be that even if, you're, if your clergy and lay leaders can't hear that call, God's bigger than that. Go to Him and say, Lord, what would you have me do? I believe God will show you. To have a congregation like that, though, requires leaders who are people of vision and also have deeply trustable integrity. They know how to articulate a vision. They know how to mobilize people to pray, learn, love, and serve together. Which takes us right back to the need of leadership development, continuing education, and raising up people to take our congregation into this new millennia with that kind of passion and vision. It was the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, whose memory we celebrated this past week, who said, all too often the religious community has been a taillight instead of a headlight. May that not be said of the Diocese of Central Florida. <laughs> Literally as the world is coming to Central Florida, can we find a way to ask God to help us to be a headlight guided by the one who is the light of the world? Thank you.